What is up my friends? Welcome back to my channel. I'm really happy to be filming today. You guys have been so, so kind and sending me so many positive, loving comments and messages about my announcement and I'm just so, so grateful and so excited that YouTube has led me here. So I'm excited to keep doing those videos and keep interacting with you guys and thank you, thank you so, so much. Today's video is gonna be another marriage video. I was out of town last Sunday and then this past Sunday, that doesn't really make sense. So the past two Sundays, I haven't had any marriage videos coming up and we were, we're ahead a couple chapters anyway. So now we are on chapter 14 and I'm really excited. So if you wanna get back into these marriage videos, then please keep watching. Chapter 14 is called Abiding Alone, Abiding Together, and Bringing Forth Fruit. Now there is a quote, I think it's from President Packer, that says, no study of human behavior will affect human behavior as much as the gospel will. And there's a quote in the beginning of this chapter that's very, very similar. It says, no understanding of human nature values the uniqueness and potential of each individual soul more than does the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what that's saying is the gospel of Jesus Christ places the most importance and significance and value on the human soul than any other thing you could possibly learn and study. When we learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we learn about where we came from and why we're here and what our purpose is and that we're more than just bodies whose lives end when we die. We learn about our divinity and our individual worth. We learn that the entire plan of salvation was created for our personal growth and development. That Jesus Christ's atonement and sacrifice was for us individually. Even if we were the only one person, even if me, Hallie Everts, was the only person except my name wouldn't be Everett's at that point. Anyway, even if I was the only person to exist on the planet, Jesus Christ still would have died for me. We fulfill that plan of salvation and our purpose here on the earth when we exercise our individual agency and our personal responsibility. No one else can do it for us. No one else has the same purpose and the same plan as we do. Even though we depend on other people, we depend on our families and our friends, even the Savior still could not do what we specifically are here to do but we are meant to do it together. It says, to enable our personal growth, our Father gave us the plan and doctrine that bring us together to each other and eventually to him. And I love, love, love this part so much. It talks about Luke chapter nine, verse 24. It says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. So in this sense, we're talking about like the hireling who would save his life. The hireling would flee from the wolf. Again, we're still using that same analogy, but who would lose their life for the sake of someone else, like the shepherd who's willing to sacrifice his life for his sheep. Like we need to be willing to sacrifice our time and our effort and our hearts for our families. We save our lives when we do that. And isn't that an interesting concept that when we give up so much, we actually receive something more. It says we lose our lives and then find them through following the Lord's commandments, which include marriage, a pattern designed precisely to promote, not prevent our personal growth and spiritual freedom. We've talked about this before in other videos. There's this idea of individualism and people are so afraid that if they get married, then they're being tied down and they're not going to be able to do the things that they want to do. They won't be themselves anymore and they won't be able to grow and experience life in the way that they would want to, but that's just not true. Then it goes into this idea, which is so interesting to me. It's the idea of therapy being bad. So it talks about there are therapists, there are lawyers, there's TV, there's the internet, all these tools, which can either be very valuable or dangerous, depending on how we use it. The reason why he says therapy might be bad is because of the way that in this pop culture he refers to it as, therapists are so focused on individualism. It says, they reflect the culture of individual liberty to the point of taking some of psychology's valuable principles to harmfully self-centered extremes. So th these principles are valuable. The things that therapists learn and that they have to teach are great. It just depends on the level that they're teaching them at. For example, the preoccupation with the self in some popular versions of look out for yourself, like self-help books and stuff, 
can easily cause us to think like hirelings. When one is thinking superficially and primarily of oneself, the appearance of any woes, aka trials, difficulties, hardships, on the horizon can make it feel like a good time to abandon the flock. I was on Twitter the other day and someone I follow retweeted something that says, if communication breaks down, stop trying to communicate. If someone doesn't treat you the way you wanna be treated, leave. Basically the whole idea was, you don't deserve that, you should walk away. But I say no. If you're not communicating well, learn to communicate better. If someone isn't treating you well, you need to tell them how you feel and then forgive them. You don't walk away, you work to make things work. But people are so quick to be like, oh, he does that to you, uh-uh, bye, you don't need him. And while yes, as we've discussed, there are some instances in extreme abuse or infidelity or certain things where, you know, if you try and try and try and it's still not getting better, maybe you should walk away depending on personal revelation. But the majority of the time, you shouldn't. But this whole age is about, no, I need to do what's best for me. I need to do what makes me happy. I don't care about anyone else. And that's just not right. It says, whatever the source of our preoccupation with self, an understanding of the gospel will show us how losing our lives actually leads to finding our lives in a covenant marriage. When this happens, one door closes and then another one opens. So I think that goes along perfectly with the idea of people getting married young and people feeling like you're gonna miss out so much on life. And some people do feel that way. If you saw my video with my friend Katie, she feels a sense of that because she got married at 19 and didn't get to finish her undergrad because she got pregnant and she was really sick. And she does feel a sense of there are things that she wanted that she envisioned for herself as an individual that she hasn't been able to accomplish. So maybe that door closed on some of those things, but that doesn't mean there aren't other doors that can open up. Like she's finding out that she loves yoga and she started a YouTube channel. She's finding other things to do. Just because you might not be able to do some things that you thought you could as an individual, doesn't mean you can't do those things and actually have a better, more meaningful experience with your spouse, your best friend, or your kids and your family by your side. It doesn't mean that your life is over. You still get to be you. You just get to be even happier living life with people who you love and people who love you. He talks about marriage and when a wife takes on her husband's name, it says their common family name means not only that she belongs to him, but that they belong together. And I love that because a lot of women right now are very into the feminist thing. And I consider myself a feminist. I consider women to be of extreme importance and value and smart and respectable, but there are so many women who take it to an extreme and they feel like, no, I don't want to take my husband's name or why do I have to take his name? Why can't he take my name? And a lot of people think the temple seems very sexist, like women aren't important. And I just don't see that at all. So I think our perspective and our attitude makes a huge difference in how we view things. Me having my husband's last name doesn't mean I'm his property. I belong to him. You could say the same thing for him. He has my last name. My last name is now Everts and so is his. So he belongs to me too. Okay, this story is so, so cool. So the guy who wrote this book, Brucey e. Hafen, is a relative of this new bride. And she and her husband just got married in the temple, but her husband's family is pretty much non-LDS. And so Elder Hafen, was going to be speaking at basically like their ring ceremony, but he really didn't know what to talk about. He was very nervous about what to share. And so he asked the husband for some information about his non LDS family. And one of the things the husband said was that he has an aunt who had just had her young child diagnosed with a very serious illness. And so maybe to be sensitive to that type of thing. Another little detail about this couple is they love the book, The Little Prince. And so their whole theme of their wedding was based around the little prince. And uh, wheat is very symbolic in that book. And so Elder Hafen decided he would look through the topical guide for stuff about wheat. And he found lots of things about the wheat and the tares. But then he also found this scripture, John chapter 12, verse 24, that says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn, a.k.a. seed, of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Elder Hafen turned this around and applied it to marriage. He said, 
Each one of us is leaving forever our life as a single person who's not accountable to a companion. In that sense, marriage represents a burial of the self, like the kernel of wheat falling to the ground where it must die to bring forth fruit. This burial allows husband and wife to join their souls through temple vows into a new life with a brand new and permanent accountability to each other and to the Lord. Like sprouted wheat, they will never again be like that hard and tiny little kernel which abideth alone. Now, as was never possible before, their lives are full of the promised fruit of their covenants, children, personal growth, and the blessings of family life. I think that is such an amazing analogy. But get this. So Elder Hafen shares this at the wedding reception. And the husband's aunt comes up to him and says, it's Easter tomorrow, so we're giving everyone these plants to celebrate. Um, it's just a pot with some soil and some seeds. And we thought you'd like to have one. You know, if you water it, the seed will grow. And I thought you'd be interested that we put a scripture on to the pot. And we just wrote this yesterday. The aunt said, we really liked what Jesus said here about himself and the resurrection. And Elder Haven looked at the pot and it's the exact same scripture that he had shared at the wedding. Like, how crazy is that? He had prayed to know what to talk to the congregation about, especially with this one woman in mind. And that same woman had had that same scripture in her mind. I thought that was the most amazing thing ever. So basically the scripture is just telling us, like marriage and like Christ, there is a burial and a resurrection. Mortal death makes eternal life possible. And when we stop abiding alone, we can bring forth the human fruit that makes it possible only by abiding together. When we are together, only then can we have the eternal life and be that fruit. Again, it goes with the idea of at one mint, the atonement, at one. You are coming together as one. I thought that was the coolest thing. I love hearing spiritual experiences like that. It seriously gave me goosebumps. Okay, chapter 15, it says, The bonds that liberate. I didn't know I had it in me. So this chapter is talking about trials, as a lot of the chapters discuss. It says, The blessings of joy are behind adversity's disguise, which I thought was such a cool analogy. If you think about it, there's adversity. That's what you can physically see is adversity. But hiding behind that mask is joy. And normally you'd want to run away, right? Like let's say you see adversity, you'd be like, oh, stay away from me. But little do you know that if you just take off the mask, it's joy. So don't push adversity away. It says, we don't always recognize treasure when we have found it, covered with grit, which is another layer of the mask. And I thought that was really good too. Sometimes, you know, piece by piece, you have to clean off what's covering up the joy. So it's not just, oh, all of a sudden here's joy. It's little by little. As you progress and as you work through the trial and as you turn to the Lord and depend on him, then you can find the joy, little pieces at a time. Elder Haven then shares a personal story of their child who is kind of a troublemaker and he was really, really in trouble at school. He needed to do very well on an assignment or else he's not going to pass. And so the mom, Elder Haven's wife, stayed up basically all night with this one child trying to help him work on this school project, but he wouldn't have it. He just wanted to be alone. And then all of a sudden, he comes out and shows his mom this project that he completed. And she had been like fighting with him for hours on it. And then he finally did it. And Elder Haven asked her, how did you get him to do that? And she was like, I, I really, I don't know. I'm not sure. I just decided that even though he was throwing a fit and he didn't want to do it, that I would still be by his side and encourage him. And then all of a sudden he just did it. And she said, I didn't know I had it in me. I mean, this child was being a brat, like a big troublemaker, very difficult. And she stood by him, even though she had other kids, even though she had other things she could have been doing, she stuck by this child. And she didn't realize that she had the patience and the tolerance to work through that. It says, Marie had dug deep enough to discover the deep internal wellsprings of her own compassion, tapping into that underground source she found within herself a well of energetic charity whose capacity far exceeded her expectations. In this way, her bonds to the child of our covenant gave her strength to lay down her life for the sheep, even an hour at a time. So even though we feel like we might not have it in us, and it is so, so hard. 
and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You can't see how this is possibly going to get better. I've had those times. I had that time in my marriage where I'm like, I don't know if CJ can change. I don't know if I can change. I don't know if I can get rid of this hurt and anger and fear that I feel inside of me. It's not going away no matter how hard I'm praying and trying to forgive him and trying to move on. It won't go away. I don't see how this is ever going to stop how it's ever going to change or how I'm ever going to feel better and you don't think you have it in you but you do I love this line it says the price we paid to become acquainted with God was a privilege to pay and that was something that one of the survivors of the Martin and Willie Hancart company said if you know anything about the pioneers they had to face horrible horrible trials and tragedies as they came across to Utah and I can say the same thing. I faced so much pain and heartbreak and writing this book and reading through these journal entries, like, uh, it just brings back all those emotions. It makes me feel sick to my stomach. I've spent so many hours crying while I've been writing this book because it was just so intense to feel those things and to write it as if I'm currently feeling it again. I, I did feel it again and it was horrible. And I mean horrible. You'll find out when you read the book, but that pain led me to have the faith that I have now and led me to depend on my Savior and use His atonement to heal my past, my horrible sins and mistakes, but also my broken heart and the sadness and misery that I felt. It was able to be healed. And I don't feel that anymore. And look at what I got. I got this amazing husband who I was able to go to the temple and marry forever and my sweet perfect baby who you can probably hear crying in the background because she doesn't want to take a nap I get to be with her forever and be her mom such an amazing privilege I'm grateful to have had the privilege to pay that price in order to be where I am now and to know God the way I know God now the last two paragraphs say so is being a partner in a genuine covenant marriage a burden or a privilege the answer is yes it's both when they are afflicted in each other's afflictions, the covenant partners drill all the way down to the deep living water of their personal covenants with him, Jesus Christ, who is afflicted in my afflictions because he feels what I feel. This three-way, if you think of it as a triangle, that wasn't a triangle, that's a triangle. This three-way continuous sharing of afflictions and covenants turns burdens into privileges. By this process, the at-oneness of marriage mirrors the at one of him, Jesus Christ, who said, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, and they may be one as we are, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. I thought that was so, so beautiful. As we depend on our spouses and the Lord, we all become one together. He is in it with us. He's involved in our lives and in our afflictions and in our hearts and in our minds. And we can come closer to him through those trials and come out and realize that it was a privilege to go through those trials, which led us closer to our Savior and closer to our spouse. We will be on chapter 16 next week. I hope you guys like these marriage videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!